Hello, hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here again. So good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you're watching. I hope that you are enjoying this room, Sophia room here at J Nation. Please follow us on Twitter at J Nation. And also uh, join us in this lecture where you can share your knowledge, you can learn more and see some companies opportunities, get more information about the communities around Portugal and also the whole globe. But that's not the fact today and right now. I'm here to talk about being a CSA told me about improving with Roy, who is founder of Open Value Amsterdam and also software developer acted at J Point. J Point. Hello, Harry. How are Hi. you? Hi, Davio. Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine as well. Thank you. But before start, please tell tell us a little bit more about you, what you do, what you do in your free time, what you enjoy to do you, as Robbie. Well, that's that's not easy, right? I, I'm a software developer and in my free time I like to do karate as a sensei. So that's about me. Okay, thank you. The stage is yours and have an amazing presentation. Thanks. Okay, hi, welcome. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, in this talk, I want to share with you what being a sensei taught me about improving, like uh, introduced by Otavio. So first about myself, a bit more. I'm Roy Bram, I'm founder of Open Value Amsterdam. Uh, and I also work as a software developer and architect at JPoint, both consultancy companies. Uh, I'm a developer for over uh, 15 years and I do karate for uh, over 30 years now. And um, While being a developer, I found out actually that it has a lot of uh, overlap because as a developer and team lead, I uh, came actually to the conclusion that I use a lot of techniques as a, as a sensei to do my work. Uh, and that's what I want to share with you. And there are some obvious things like, I like doing uh, coding dojos. And of course, I like to be in the dojo as a, as a sensei or as a, a participant in karate. Um, I like doing coding katas. Uh, I also like, Uh, doing katas, uh, physical katas uh, in the dojo. And I like the Karate API testing framework. Uh, and of course, I also like to do uh, Karate even in the snow. And as a developer, of course, I like to build new features uh, and I occasionally also uh, sometimes break things. Not quite often, I don't write bugs, but sometimes I break things. You can uh, follow me on, uh, on Twitter also. Uh, my Twitter handle is there. Uh, if there's uh, not enough room left uh, for, uh, for questions uh, uh, afterwards, I will be on Slack. And anyways, you can always contact me on Twitter. So at some point I became a Sensei and people start calling you Sensei. For me, it was around 20, 20 years and a bit more uh, ago. And I really like um, Japanese, and I especially like the kanji, uh, one of the Japanese writing styles, and, and this these signs, uh, Sensai is both has two kanjis, um, Sen and Sai, and what I love about uh, kanji is that it, every um, sign has a is a concept, it's not just like um, uh, Western languages where we have characters, but they have actually concepts, and Sen means early or ahead of time, And Sai is a bit more difficult to explain, but it explains something like uh, it was, represents a living thing and, and learns. Uh, sai is, for example, used in life. So if you literally translate it, this is a Sensai is a person who's been born before another or one who comes before. In Japan, it indicates some seniority. And It shows you, if you can carry this title as a sensei, that you achieved some level of mastery. So if you look at our software development teams, a sensei is a more senior person that helps others in the team uh, and leads the team. So like a senior developer. So maybe you're also a sensei, but not in karate. And I learned a lot of things uh, while being a sensei and especially about teaching. And teaching is, of course, a form of knowledge sharing. 
And I found out that teaching or any form of knowledge sharing is quite hard um, because it needs a lot of experience on the topic. Uh, you need to be good at it before you can teach it, but also you need to learn how to transfer your knowledge to the people attending your sessions or your lessons. Um, so you have to learn how to teach because an expert doesn't make you a good teacher um, in general, right? And if you think teaching is hard or knowledge sharing is hard, then try long-term teaching. And with long-term teaching, I mean um, that you have to bring multiple persons from A to, to skill level B uh, on, a, on an amount of time. So you have to do um, uh, more, more sessions with them and you have to really make a plan to move them from one skill set to another skill set, for example. So long-term teaching is, of course, much harder because it involves also planning and um, knowing which parts are good and which parts are not good. It also costs you a lot of dev devotion and energy. And uh, the energy uh, works for me. The more energy I put in my, uh, in my in preparation and in lessons, uh, the more I get back from it. So the more it will work. And teaching and knowledge sharing is also about preparation. And it's for both for being a sensei, but also for being a, a, in our development uh, culture, you need to come prepared if you want to, to share your knowledge. And I always hear people saying, uh, I don't have to prepare myself anymore because I, I know it all, but imagine what they could achieve uh, when they uh, do prepare that themselves. Because I think then again, still coming prepared makes it much better. And although it's a lot of effort, it's totally worth it. You get so much in return because um, while sharing knowledge, you multiply it. And um, well, it's just, it's just nice to see how everybody uh, uh, improves. So in general, I learned a lot of things uh, while being a Sensei. And I see a lot of similarities with uh, our development in Agile teams. So for example, um, uh, do it right the first time. It sounds quite obvious. So in, in karate, uh, we also have that. Um, you might know that there is a thing called muscle memory. So our muscles have memory. Um, by repetition, repetition, the same movement, our, um, our muscles are actually memorizing our movement. And although maybe we do it uh, much later again, and we didn't do it for a long period, still there are some cells in our muscles that are not destroyed and they still remember the way we move. Take, for example, cycling also. Uh, once you learn cycling, well, everybody in here in Holland, I'm from Holland, and everybody here in the Netherlands uh, learned how to cycle, of course. And although you didn't cycle for a very long period, you still know how to cycle. You never unlearn it. So that's something called muscle memory. Uh, so we also uh, uh, use this muscle memory, of course, at karate. And what we do is that, well, what we see actually is that when we learn people uh, a movement, for example, a punch or a kick, uh, if we do that, we learn it uh, with them like 100, 100 repetitions, we see that they know how to move. And then still, it needs a lot of training to let it come into to the muscle memory. But we see that we only need 100 repetitions to learn a a movement. Maybe not perfect, but it's there. But the other way around, if we need to fix a uh, incorrect movement, it will take us a lot more repetitions, around 1500 repetitions. So we see that if we don't do it the, the proper way the first time, we have to fix it later with much more repetitions. And as I prove, we see that with our kids. Uh, the kids have a lot of things on their minds. They always look around, they do have all kind of other things doing in our lessons. Uh, and later on, when they need to perfect their movements, uh, it takes them much more time than the adults or the young adults that are more and more focused on learning it correctly the first time. I think it's the same with uh, software development. So, of course, there's a thing called technical debt. Everybody knows it. And there's there will always be technical debt. It doesn't matter how much or how good you do your job because um, uh, software will evolve and there will be bit fraud, etc. So you cannot prevent it, but you can try to do it good the first time and not implementing any any technical debt the first time. It's just like teaching karate, right? Because fixing it later, just like teaching a movement and fixing it later, takes much more time um, uh, later on if you want to fix it. 
And it might look like that the first, the fast, um, it's fast on the short run, but then again, it backfires on you with some technical debt. You have to fix it. Another thing is um, learn before you repeat. It has a lot of things in common with the, with the last thing, uh, with the previous slides. But first, you have to learn the basics. And actually, then the training starts. So you need to learn the movements before you actually try to uh, and get it better and better and better at it. So after learning it, the training really starts. And repeating only makes it better, just like agile software development. We make something and we start improving it. And then the actual training starts. So we need to, in software development, we need to understand actually the thing we're trying to, to do before we are starting to automate it. Because that's the difference with karate and, and software development. Um, software developers are lazy, and lazy is a good thing because when you're lazy, you start automating things, right? So we don't um, do it all over, 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 over again. If we see that we have some repetitions, we will automate it and uh, we will try to improve that automation um, to make it better and better. Let's say, first understand what you're doing, then automate it. A sensor is also, about, is also a apprentice. And I think um, that's the same with software development. So I have a sensor, but I also learned a lot of uh, things from others. Like I even learned a lot of things from kids, like six or seven years old. I also learned a lot from uh, beginners and juniors that just started with karate. It just showed me different things that I learned and I took on my in my in my bag as I as a sensei on my trip of being a, a good sensei. So while being a sensei, you should always be open to learn. And I think that's the same with software development. You should listen to what others have to say. So I always try to listen to what others have to say. I always try to learn from others what they um, what they bring up, what their arguments are about certain topics. Uh, because remember, you can't be a specialist in everything. There's always somebody that's better in a certain thing than you are. So why not learn from these persons and become a, uh, improve yourself in becoming a better um, software developer or architect or whatever you want? One of the other things that became very important for me was that every lesson lesson has a girl. Let me take a drink. So. There are many, many types of lessons in, in karate, uh, but you need to be sure that it's always clear for yourself when starting a lesson or a knowledge sharing or, or a, a, uh, anything else that, that involves knowledge sharing that what your goal is. So goals can be like a mental exercise or a or it can be like that you want to train stamina, uh, um, stamina or you want to learn new things or well, you can come up with any other lessons that you want to do, such, same as karate as, as in software development. But for you, the goal should be clear. And while sharing, and while uh, actually doing your knowledge sharing, you should judge if the things that you're doing, if it adds something to the goal that you had in mind in the beginning. I think that's precisely the same as we, we want to be in software development. So as a software developer, architect, or team lead, I always try um, to prepare myself and know what I want to achieve. Um, so share your knowledge uh, with a goal. But it's not only with sharing knowledge, it's also while giving feedback or while you're having a meeting. There should be a, at least a goal that you want to achieve. Uh, but also while programming, if you're implementing certain features, uh, still remember what you want to achieve. And one of the other things is respect. And I think uh, respect is, a, is a, a big topic in martial arts, uh, also in karate, um, because martial arts is about respect. It's while you enter the dojo, we take a bow and we greet everybody. Uh, before starting a training with a partner, we also bow, which means uh, we will respect each other, uh, but also even in competitions. For example, if you look at the competitions uh, of karate, it's not allowed to... Uh, discuss with a uh, with a referee, for example. If you do that, you will get uh, some punishment points or some some um, uh, points. Um, so even in competition, this is a is a big topic. And of course, respect goes both ways. So it goes like a 
uh, from pupil to, to teacher, but also the other way around. And that's how respect works, right? And on this topic of respect, um, well, I, I, I was a sensei for a long period already. Um, and my I was, of course, teaching the way my sensei teached because he was my biggest example. And he always had uh, things like respect for each other. And, and we were, uh, he was also sharing that respect for each other is actually the base of creating a safe environment to let everybody improve. And he gave me this book, um, which was for me a, actually a, an, uh, an eye opener. It's a book from uh, Alice Under. Uh, maybe somebody knows it. Uh, if you are a, a martial artist, then uh, be sure to get this book. I have it somewhere here in Dutch also. Let me check. Yeah, I have it here in Dutch. So it's a very good book. So if you can read Dutch and you want to borrow it, uh, contact me, it's fine. Um, and this book is about really recognizable situations. And Alessandro writes about old, wise uh, martial artists. He writes about power and how to use it and how it is abused. And this book is not only about martial artists, but it's also about human. Like how are we actually uh, working together and, and how are the power relationships between, uh, the balances between uh, power between different persons are uh, used. And it's about our relationship uh, together in a team, but it's also about how hierarchy works in our society, but also in our teams, in our work. And, and this book actually made me think, because before reading this book, I got taught, of course, like my, my teacher taught me, that a sensei should be a enabler. It should be a more senior person that tries to improve the ones surrounding him or her. And of course, senior is not about age, but it's about a skill level. And a sense I should always be an example. It should always be an inspiration to others. And a sense I should also make clear that it's okay to make mistakes and it should create a safe harbor for everybody to, to learn things. And this, you will see as, a, uh, as, as Buddha or martial arts has a lot of, of these kind of things as an example for, for different, uh, different areas like, uh, well, management, for example. This is what a sensor should be. But the book also uh, writes about a different side of this, like a more darker side of being a, a sensei and used the, the sensei as an, as, an, as an example. It's also about uh, the Me Too discussion. So this book was written before the whole Me Too discussion, of course, but it's also about uh, the balance of power and how it, it is abused by people and how respect actually transfers to worshiping instead of two-way respect I explained before. It's about power abuse and it's very recognizable. And if you're a, a martial artist, you will recognize a lot of these kind of situations, but it's also very recognizable when you're uh, not a martial artist, but you're just a, or not just, but you're a, a developer, for example, in a team. You'll recognize these kind of things. And it really opened my mind because a lot of these things looked uh, very harmful to me, but actually they're quite evil. And what I recognize that, that these balances and these abuses, uh, they are there, but you should be really aware of it so you can make the decisions, um, the good decisions yourself, uh, not to abu abuse these kind of things. But it's clear, and we all know uh, in the news, that, that uh, this abuse of these power balances uh, is there. So be aware of it. So next one is a dojo. So, Probably you all know about a dojo. It's a training place, right? And again, it's kanji. So it has two signs, do and jo. Do means the way and jo means place. So dojo is a place of the way. It's a place to learn. It's a place to improve. It's a place where respect is very important and we respect, respect each other. It's a safe place to improve. And everybody is different in there. Although we wear the same uh, same uh, suit, of course, the karate gi. So everybody's different, but we try to be as equal as possible. And of course, we have all different belts and we try to train each other, but there are some differences, but everybody's equal. And that's in a dojo. And maybe, maybe it's me and it's probably some speculation. So uh, don't pin me on it. But if we look at the Mandalorian, 
maybe you saw this series. I can uh, highly advise you to watch it. Um, the Mandalorian always say, this is the way. So, and the way, of course, is as a dough in, uh, in, uh, in Kanji or in, in Japan. So, and the main character called Man Doe. So the man who follow it, follows the way, like this is the way. And if you look at Mandalore, the planet, um, that probably would be a dojo. So the writers of, uh, of the Mandalorian uh, might be infected with the, the Japanese and the Kanji uh, science and, the, and, the, and also the Budo and the macho arts, or, uh, macho arts principles. But talking about the dojo, we also know, of course, the coding dojo. And um, on purpose, it's called a coding dojo, of course, because it's a, again, a place to learn, a, pay, a place where you teach and you improve each other. It's a place where fellow developers will improve each other, not in a non-competitive way. And that's actually the same how we are treating a dojo in karate. I think this already came, um, came by a lot of times. And that's a safe environment to learn. So a, a dojo or it doesn't matter any, anywhere. Uh, you should always, as a sensei, create a safe environment to learn because um, that will make people improve the best. And that's not only about a, a, um, a physical thing that it should be safe to come there, but it should also be a mental thing. So people should be happy to come back later. And although um, and coming back to uh, do the, the knowledge goals you might have, uh, some lessons will be about burning you down and building you up again. But then it should always be um, because you want to achieve a certain goal, you want to achieve something, right? So because I had bad feelings leaving uh, or feelings after trainings because I had to do for three hours long the same exercise over and over again because it was not good enough. But still, I had the feeling that I was training and I was working in a safe environment. Um, and I think uh, that's what we sometimes forgot, and it's in, in the minor details, but always be aware that also in, in system software developments that you should create a safe environment. And uh, for our software development teams, it should be uh, safe, right? A team should be safe. If you are not safe in a team, um, you cannot improve each other. So you might be a sensei in your team, much more senior person, then please be aware that you always create a safe environment for every team member. And this, uh, then it comes for me to improving, uh, and I will call it improving plus plus, I will um, later call it a bit different. But in the beginning, I was a very, well, you could say traditional teacher. Um, uh, I don't have much pictures actually of myself uh, uh, giving, um, a training as a sensei, but this is on a summer camp where we're actually obeying everybody to do push-ups. And I let the, the ones already on the ground wait till everybody's uh, ready to start, right? So I was a very traditional teacher uh, in the way um, that I use traditional improving. And with traditional improving, I mean uh, that we observe, categorize, and then start improving. Um, so with observe, categorize, and improving, I mean that we first look at the, uh, the, the people that we want to improve, we observe, we try to categorize all the things that are good and the, the, that are bad, and we start improving those things. And we always start with improving the worst thing. So the thing that uh, comes up uh, most and is the worst thing uh, that we want to improve first. And we call it a code rack technique. I don't think it's an official name, but with a code rack technique, I'm uh, mentioning that because a, a code rack, because uh, what we do and while observing and categorizing, we're hanging everything on a code rack. So the things that are worst, we put them the lowest in the code rack and the things that are good, we put them higher in the code rack. And we start working from, working from the bottom up to the top. So we start always with focusing what can improve the most. And those are the things that are on the lowest part of the code track. That's how it works for us. So that's what I call uh, traditional improving. So focus on what can be improved the most. And that's always the bad things, right? So at some point, I think, um, well, I'm not even sure how long ago, but it was a, a while ago, like 15 years ago or something, my teacher, and this is my teacher, my, my sensei actually, I should say, 
And my sensor, Johan van der Hoofdakker, he's already uh, doing karate for over 60 years now. Uh, he's a well-known teacher in the Netherlands. Um, and he came to me and I said, well, um, I'm doing karate for, well, more than, um, let's say, uh, 45 years now. And I'm a, uh, a teacher for more than 20 years now, probably. But I think we can do it better. We're doing things wrong and we should improve the way we improve people. And we started a sort of journey. He found out a couple of things and he wanted to transfer those knowledge uh, to uh, karate. And for example, uh, we came across these four teams. They have some things in common. They're all, indeed, they're all Dutch, orange. Uh, sorry for the Portuguese uh, soccer fans. Actually, um, Nigel de Jong, the one that kicked uh, Xavi Alonso in the World Championships finals against Portugal, is not in this picture, so don't blame me. Sorry, uh, Portugal, it's not there. So, um, but, we came across these, these four teams and there was a, uh, except they're all orange Dutch and they're all uh, participating in some sort of sports. There was another thing that was quite in common. So at the, uh, at the top left, we have the Dutch soccer, soccer under 21 um, uh, team that won the uh, European championship in 2006, 2007. Uh, right of that, we have the uh, speed skating. Well, speed skating is a typical Dutch sport. Uh, but this is uh, uh, the team that won three gold medals in the Olympics in 1998. Uh, we have on the bottom left, we have the ladies hockey team that won the Olympics in 2008, which was quite good for in that time. Um, and uh, at the bottom right, we have the water polo team, which also won uh, in the Olympics the gold medal in 2008. And so these teams have something in common. They have actually a coach that is do, doing things differently. They're all doing it differently the same way, but they're all doing things differently in comparison with other coaches. So at the top left, we have Foppedaan, right, uh, top right, we have Henk Gremser, left, we have Mark Lammers, and right, uh, right bottom right, we have Robin van Gaal. And they did things different because they were actually focusing on the positive things. So like I said in the beginning, uh, traditional improving, we look at the, at the things that we need to improve, the worst things, but they actually looked at the most positive things. And they started improving the things that were already good. So if you, for example, if you can, in karate, you can kick quite well with your left leg, uh, then we train uh, kicking with your left leg much more, more and more and more and more. Because they found out that improving these good things that actually the rest, so the things that are worst, will automatically come because people will enjoy more. They will, while improving one thing, they will also improve all the other things. And of course, there should be a certain minimal level. So at least you, you should do it good, right, properly, because otherwise it's not a, a good enough. But uh, for example, uh, with water polo, they throw with both hands, right? So the coach came to the conclusion that he always let them throw with the hand that was bad or worst, but he let them actually throw with their hand that was already the best one, that hand, and it showed that it automatically also improved the other hand. And we call it positive coaching or positive improving or positive feedback. It doesn't matter, positive te teaching. It's a positive approach of uh, sharing knowledge in a way uh, we do very directly with uh, the participants uh, where we want to share your, our knowledge with. And positive coaching has some rules. And these rules are very important. And by living by these rules, um, we are focusing on a more positive way of improving persons. And one of these rules is that we should observe what's positive instead of observing what's worse than what we need to improve first. One of the other rules is that we should be really task oriented instead of result oriented. So instead of telling them uh, that they should win, we are now telling them that they should attack uh, over the left flank, for example, right? We're giving them a task instead of a result. And with this, of course, comes that we should value the effort instead of the result. I think nobody wants to um, 
have a bad result, right? It's about the effort somebody puts in there. And if the effort is good and everybody and somebody's doing his utterly best to to improve, um, then you should value that instead of the result somebody's uh, having. And of course, the base is a okay to fail culture. So you should be aware that it's okay to fail. And um, and we, we give them constructive feedback. And with constructive feedback, um, I always use a, a what they call a feedback sandwich. Uh, works very good for me. Uh, I always use if, then. So for example, um, if you do this, then this and this and this will improve. It's called a feedback sandwich and it gives you a, a, a way of giving constructive feedback instead of you're doing it all wrong, it needs, needs to be like this. And if you're giving this constructive feedback, um, try or give at least three compliments. So for every constructive feedback you give, you should give also three compliments. This makes you again, observe what's positive, the first rule of, of positive coaching. And if you ask something from somebody like, um, um, like if they understood what you're saying, always ask a open question because Open questions will make you listen to what others have to say and will make you think and learn and try to improve the way you improve. And most important thing of this all is that you have to mean it. So if you cannot come up with three compliments then, and you because you don't mean it, then don't do it, right? You have to really mean it because uh, I think the human brain is very capable of recognizing if somebody doesn't mean it. And while I was actually uh, uh, on this journey of more positive coaching, uh, well, years later, I came actually to the conclusion that it's everywhere now. So um, maybe it's in the Netherlands, but I see it a lot of uh, for, for everywhere. So for example, we started a competition for kids where we value effort more than results. So they will get points if they attend a competition uh, and they will get more points if they win, of course, but still by attending the competition, they can, uh, win uh, medals, right? And although we were early adopter, I also saw that the school of my kids, my kids are six and eight now, and I actually saw that they have a, a positive um, uh, coaching thing at their school. Well, but with that, they actually uh, value the effort of the kids and they, uh, they, uh, they give them something if they uh, are uh, uh, good, doing good things. But they also see it now with a lot of Dutch sport federations. Uh, and the larger uh, organizations like soccer, hockey, and volleyball. So that's really good. And they actually have very clear instructions for volunteers. So the moms and dads that are uh, going up early uh, to go with their kids and the pupils to, uh, to, to uh, match, they actually have clear instructions how to do this positive coaching and how do you, to use these kind of rules to improve the kids in a more positive way. And I also see with more and more uh, pro sports. So for me, it was like a, rec uh, a recognition, like, okay, it's everywhere. And I now know that people are um, doing this because it actually works. And so it's proven it works. And being the grumpy guy that that has um, something to say about everything that's, that's bad, that uh, doesn't work. So for me, this is a very clear thing. Uh, positive coaching works much better than focusing on the negative things uh, of a improvement. So back to, uh, so we took the quite a detour now. Uh, so back to uh, software development. So how is this working actually with, with software development? So how am I trying to uh, use this in uh, my daily uh, work as a software development architect or team lead? Well, actually I'm trying to live as much by these rules. So try to look at the things that are actually positive and try to improve those things uh, even much more, even better instead of focusing on the things that are negative. And also try to be task oriented instead of result oriented. Uh, value effort more than result because if somebody does a pull request uh, and he does, did a bad bad job, uh, you should value his effort instead of the result because maybe he's not capable of, of doing it uh, better, right? So you should help him with that. And we should create an okay to fill culture. I think that's, uh, more and more done in, in uh, the companies uh, I see. Uh, and also know that you have to give constructive feedback 
give compliments, ask open questions, and like I said, the most important thing, mean it. So you can use these these rules on a daily daily basis uh, while working in a team. So one of the, these rules, the the top one, observe and focus on what's positive. Um, I want to give you an example. Of what I what I most of the time see in teams is when we do a retro, we are always hanging well stickies most of the times. Uh, well in uh, these COVID uh, times, you probably do it on a screen or something, or maybe you don't do it anymore. Uh, but most of the times, we focus on the, the things. We have good things. We want things that we want to keep, and we have things that we want to improve. Uh, the bad things, right? So it was good and bad. And what, most of the times, what I see is that we look at those good things, and we group them. and say, oh, nice. Yeah, okay, nice. And we put them away. And we immediately start focusing on the things that we, we think that are worse that we want to improve. And why not focus on the things that are already good? Because I think that if those things that are on the uh, the bad side of the, of, the, of the retro board, if they are there, uh, they're probably not that important because if they are really an impediment, they were probably already solved while uh, being in, a, in an agile sprint, right? So why not focus on these things that are already pretty good and try focus on improving those kind of points because I'm convinced that while improving those things that are already good, the others will automatically also become better. And also during our uh, daily work, we should focus on, on the tasks instead of the results. Uh, I see a lot of times stories on boards that uh, are actually results of how you want to, to have it, but a story on a board or a task should be about uh, what do you need to do to complete it? Because that's the whole purpose, right? So always focus on the tasks instead of uh, the results. So it should be clear what you want to do and not what you want to achieve. And value uh, effort over result. Well, like this kid, I think everybody that has kids as a, as a parent or uh, received a, a, a drawing from a kid, they all know that the effort is much more important than uh, the result, right? Well, at least for my kids, the things that I got from them, well, I value the effort, let's, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, it's the same with, with software development, right? Um, um, if a more junior person picks up a very difficult task and uh, is doing his utterly best to get something but doesn't meet the result you're actually expecting, at, at least uh, value the effort somebody's put in there. And, also value that the one that you more junior person picked up a quite hard story for him and actually is trying to improve himself by uh, picking up something that's quite difficult for him. And create a okay to fail feature, uh, okay to fail culture. And it, I think it's our jobs as software engineers that we should uh, create, uh, well, we should create an okay to fail culture, but also try to uh, minimize the effect of failures. So if somebody makes a failure, uh, don't let it all crash the whole application, but be robust and try to build something that's actually uh, can, well, can beat those failures and try to minimize the risks as, as much as possible, but never punish somebody for uh, creating a mistake. I think it's okay to make mistakes. And if that mistake is actually uh, crashing uh, your whole app and is causing a, uh, a, a big problem, then don't look at that person that made the mistake, but ask yourself, how could that small mistake actually uh, crash our whole system? So try to create this culture that it's okay to fail. And if you are giving feedback, like I said, give constructive feedback. So if somebody missed all the unit tests, don't tell them, man, you missed all the unit tests, uh, uh, your pull request is uh, declined. But no, but tell them like, Hey, man, if you write a unit test, then the quality of our code is, is, is uh, guaranteed. So our code is much better. But try to explain them uh, why you gave this feedback. And try to give at least uh, three compliments. And um, uh, this is a funny one. Um, I see people already struggling with giving compliments. Uh, it's good. It's, it's okay to give compliments. And, and also try to do this as much as possible. It maybe feels a bit... Uh, awkward in the beginning, but also if you're having pull requests or working as a, with pull requests or working with um, 
pair programming or extreme programming, if you see something that's done pretty well, uh, don't mind giving a compliment about it because that's also what feedback is about. And ask open questions, right? So with open questions, um, asking, for example, why somebody did the way, uh, implemented the way they actually did, you hear things that you uh, might learn, or at least the person that's telling you should, should tell you how it works and he, he might learn something, right? So it's very important to ask open questions instead of closed questions, um, I think. And most important thing is that you should mean it, right? So uh, always be yourself. If this doesn't work for you or certain things uh, don't work for you, then only pick the ones that you that works for you because you should really, really mean it. So I'm almost at the end of my presentation, uh, which is, well, it took me like 40 minutes. Um, it feels for me a bit, strange to uh, put everything I learned uh, in the last, uh, well, 20 years, let's say 20 years, in 15 minutes of presentation. But um, I try. I hope that you actually now try to watch also at other areas or other pros, how are they in doing improvements? But because, for example, sport coaches, they continuously are focused on improving their team. And I think we as software developers should should also look at those kind of uh, areas and try to see how they improve things and how we could, could uh, use these kind of things to improve. And try to be a bit more positive and try to focus on the positive things uh, that are happening around you and also uh, value the effort somebody's putting into it. Because I'm convinced that the more focus you have on the things that are already good, uh, it will definitely improve all the other things that are maybe not so good. It's already proven by others. And um, as you can see, as I showed you, you can look it up. Probably there's in your country also some, some uh, people that are following these positive uh, principles. Uh, and I hope there is a, a sensei in all of you and you could learn uh, people around you to become a better person or a better developer or a better whatever they want. Thank you. Wow, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, I don't know if he, if there is any question, please you have the opportunity to join me on YouTube channel or also in the Slack, please. If you are around, uh, put your question. You still have eight minutes to go, so please let me know. Okay, let me check here. If that's not something what I sense I can do, bend time. I always focus on a certain <laughs> a time and I'm always, uh, well, okay. either way, time short or too fast. But anyway, are you in the Slack channel of the nation? Uh, if I yes, could so. you please share your, Slack, your slides? Yeah. I can. Okay, okay. Hello, everyone. Is there any questions? Give once, give twice. So that is it. Thank you, everybody. That was amazing to be here. Again, I hope that we enjoy and see you in a couple of minutes in the next session. Again, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Tavio. Bye bye. Bye.